Welcome to America's Web Radio. This is Ron Bachman, and you're listening to Healthcare Insight. Healthcare Insight, we've been talking about the health of the country, and certainly the health of the country involves looking at our past, our future, the policies of our government, the stories of our developing as a country, and this week is Martin Luther King uh, holiday um, on Monday, but the entire week we ought to be celebrating the life of a man who only in retrospect for many in this country recognized the genius and the appropriateness of the way he tried to change this country in a peaceful, loving way. Now, I was born in 1949, so my youth through his development as a leader of the African-American community um, was something that I didn't pay a lot of attention to. Oh, I heard my parents talk about him, both good and bad, uh, typically with a great deal of hesitation about the power that he was accumulating and where he might be leading uh, the minority in this country. But it turns out that his leadership was a peaceful movement as opposed to Malcolm X, who was very militant. And I don't think people at the time either appreciated his Christian faith and his strong faith in peaceful um, change, much like um, Gandhi in um, India, uh, that Martin Luther King was a man of peace, a man of faith. And I think there was a lot of suspicion as to whether he really believed what he was saying and whether it would turn once he gained power. And it didn't. Um, he was the man right up until the moment of his assassination, which was a real tragedy for this country, because if his leadership continued beyond there, I think we would be a different place than we are today. So what I would like to do is I would like to give a brief overview in this first segment of who the man really was and some of the background and some of the explanations of him. So I found a great video, again, on YouTube that you can go and find for yourself and hear the entire YouTube. But I want to present this, segments of it at least, as a really good overview and bio of Martin Luther King that maybe many of you in the audience um, never knew. Um, never had really listened to because I found very few views on this uh, YouTube presentation, but I really do think it's a good overview. I certainly learned some things that I didn't know before. So let's pause and let's listen to this overview of the biography of this great man, Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a minister and leading activist during the 20th century civil rights movement. He was born Michael Luther King Jr. on January 15, 1929 in Atlanta, and later changed his name to Martin. King grew up steeped in religion and activism. His father was a reverend at Ebenezer Baptist Church and a local NAACP leader. A talented student, King skipped two grades in high school and entered Morehouse College at age 15. King was skeptical about Christianity as a boy, but later embraced his faith and entered the seminary. King established himself as a rising star in the civil rights movement. After Rosa Parks' arrest in Alabama in December 1955 for refusing to give up her seat to a white passenger, the NAACP chose King to lead the Montgomery bus boycotts. The protests ultimately led to a U.S. Supreme Court decision which outlawed segregation on public buses in Alabama. You know, it's hard for many of us today, especially those who weren't alive during the time to realize that we had this terrible cultural social situation where the black community was not allowed to eat in restaurants or sit at counters or to use the same restrooms or use the same public system of buses. Um, that was where it all started with the Rosa Parks situation uh, highlighting the inability of the black community to experience the full freedoms of the United States. And I think we're going to hear more from this perspective that Dr. King brought to the awareness, to the consciousness of this country. He did it in a quiet, soft, loving, Christian way so that that soft voice was heard loud and clear 
that there were inequities in this country that needed to be addressed. So let's hear a little bit more of the biography of how he developed um, into this leadership position and the types of activities that he got involved with. With civil rights demonstrations emerging all over the country, King helped organize the Southern Christian Leadership Conference to unite them. Inspired by Mahatma Gandhi, King advocated nonviolent protests like boycotts and sit-ins. King's experience, passion for the cause, and position in the community gave him the credentials to become a leader in the 381-day boycott of the city buses. On December 20, 1956, the Supreme Court ruled segregated buses to be unconstitutional. This was a major victory for the civil rights cause and proved King's nonviolent methods of protest could yield results. So I want the audience to think about this. There were two ways of creating this revolution, this activity to improve the lives of the minorities in this country who had been given the Emancipation Proclamation a hundred years earlier, but really had still not experienced the um, American dream and were discriminated against in so many different ways. So now we have a man who steps forward, a man of peace, but was he treated equally with peace? Was his peaceful, quiet approach recognized by the general public? It certainly was by some of the politicians, and I'll talk about that in another segment. But let me go to this biography and talk about the kind of personal uh, vitriol that he had to deal with and how he was able to retain his peaceful Christian view towards the world, even under his own persecution of himself and his family. King was now the national face of the civil rights cause. He was jailed over 20 times, was once stabbed in the chest, his house was bombed, and he suffered relentless personal attacks on himself and his family. So here was a man leading a movement. Remember, we're after World War II, where people in this country fought for our freedoms and freedoms around the world. We freed up. Europe. We freed up the uh, Pacific Coast area from the Japanese and the Europeans from Nazism. And now we're back home and we're within 10, 15 years of the conclusion of that war for freedom, many of which the African American community fought for, but they didn't have the freedoms in the United States that the people in these other countries that we fought for uh, then had. So he maintained this idea of love and freedom and peace to make more changes in the United States so that we could have true equality as guaranteed to everybody in our Constitution. So let's go back to the biography and hear a few words from his son, from himself, and from some of the biographies describing the man, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. It was the spirit of love that he exhibited that transformed a lot of lives. We still have the attitude of love. He used to say, I love everybody. I'm every man's brother. You may not love me, but that's your issue, not mine. Dr. King inspired thousands of people through his eloquence and through his fearlessness, especially after his home was firebombed with his wife and his children. They showed through their courage that they were prepared to give their lives to the cause of freedom. So we've heard a little bit of the background and the dangers that he and his family had to survive through. Um, let's take a minute and listen to another biographer describe more about the man himself, his attitude towards others, attitude towards himself, so we can better understand what kind of drove this individual to approach the problem of racism in the United States, of discrimination in the United States, in the way that he did. Martin Luther King pretty much said you had to do two things in order to be free. You have to forgive everybody for everything they've ever done to you, and number two, you have to lose your fear of death. So again, audience, for those of you who didn't live through this period of time, maybe really aren't familiar with the history, other than that, we have a Martin Luther King Day to celebrate. You've heard a few things in the media. 
Now that we know that the man was a man of peace, a man of God, a man of love, a man of a different approach following Mahatma Gandhi's approach of nonviolence, did he live by that? Yes, the words were there, but let's look at the example of where his own home was bombed, firebombed, his family was threatened, could have died. How did he respond to that kind of attack on him personally? Could he live up to his own words? Let's hear what happened right after the bombing and he came home and found out what was going on. Three to five hundred angry black people are here. They have guns and knives and sticks and holes and shovels and pitchforks. Amid that angry crowd that could have exploded any minute, this young creature who was a very, very special human being came home. And it didn't take him any words to calm those people down. All he did was raise his hand, and it was kind of like, peace be still, told his people to go home. He who lives by the sword will die by the sword, and we have to love our white brothers and sisters even though they're not loving us back. Go home, he said, God will take care of us. And that's exactly what the people did. Well, there you have it, the man who actually lived by his words in the worst of times for himself, in the most dangerous times for himself. Now, most people don't fully understand how active he was in the civil rights movement. Yes, he was the leader, but was he just a figurehead? How active was he moving around the country, writing books, um, making presentations, getting involved in the political structure to understand how laws and regulations and cultures could be changed. Well, here's a little bit of a snippet uh, giving a very brief description of how active he actually was. King worked tirelessly to promote the cause he so strongly believed in. And from 1957 through 1968, he traveled over 6 million miles, delivered 2,500 speeches, wrote five books and dozens of articles. King had become such a force in America that he was named Time Magazine's Man of the Year in 1963, when in 1964, he became the youngest man ever to win the Nobel Peace Prize. Many of Martin Luther King's critics at the time, and even some today, look back at him and see an entirely different picture than I've just described. Some thought he was a Marxist, that he was trying to change the United States in ways that were completely against our founding documents. But let me, again, go to another biographer that explains, and we'll hear more throughout this hour about how he loved this country and how he respected our founding documents. Martin Luther King Jr. was an American. He was deeply American. And what's striking to me is that he had more confidence and faith in American democracy in the Constitution and in the principles of fairness and opportunity than nearly all of his critics. So let's take a quick break and I want to come back and we want to listen to some of the exact words of the man that we just described. So it's not somebody talking about him, but him presenting his ideas like you probably never have heard before. Welcome back to America's Web Radio. This is Ron Bachman, and we're continuing with uh, the Martin Luther King emphasis in this podcast, recognizing that Monday was Martin Luther King Day, but I think we should celebrate the man throughout the entire week. So I want to present more uh, directly around Martin Luther King's uh, thoughts and opinions, how it applied back in the 1960s, and how now, 55 years later, it still applies. Yes, we've made a lot of progress socially in black-white relationships in many areas of housing and schooling and work environments, but we've also lacked uh, progress in so many areas of allowing the American dream to be realized in much of the black community, especially in the inner city uh, urban areas. And so I want to do the rest of this program listening to a presentation by Dr. King that was made in 1967. 
it was to a uh, college. And I want to ask the questions, leading questions about what he's going to talk about and maybe do some analysis uh, by breaking up the speech into various pieces and highlighting how the problems existed then and they still exist today and where we might have actually made some progress on things that he he dreamed about. Now, most people know about his I have a dream speech. And that's something that you even hear played on TV and on radio and other broadcasts during this week. But one of his other presentations that doesn't get highlighted very much is this presentation that he makes, he calls the other America, so that we have this great divide and he identifies the problems and issues and potential solutions to this divided America. And that is certainly even more so today than maybe ever before. But his philosophy of nonviolence, his philosophy of love, his philosophy of trying to get along between the races so that we are uh, a humankind and not black or white, but that we are all one family. That's what I want to focus on. So let me turn now to the actual words and recordings of Dr. King about this theme of the other America that everybody listening to this program today ought to take to heart and really think about what progress we've made and how much further we need to go after 55 years of these words that you'll hear directly from him. There are literally two Americas. One America is beautiful for situation. And in a sense, this America is overflowing with the milk of prosperity and the honey of opportunity. This America is the habitat of millions of people who have food and material necessities for their bodies, and culture and education for their minds, freedom and human dignity for their spirits. In this America, millions of people experience every day the opportunity of having life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in all of their dimensions. And in this America, millions of young people grow up in the sunlight of opportunity. Notice here that Martin Luther King Jr. does not focus initially on the downtrodden or trying to make claims about how to improve those people who are on the bottom of the scale, economic scale, social scale. He talks first about the beauty of America as it exists so that that is the target, that is the goal. It's not to tear down what is working, but it is ultimately talking about building up and giving opportunity for those at the lower end. It's a very different message than what you hear today from our political leaders. It is more of let's equalize by bringing down the people who have been successful as if there is just a one size pie instead of an expanding pie. So I think it's really important to recognize that what he's saying is the American dream is out there and many have experienced it. And I think what he's going to go on and talk about is how do we bring the people who are not experiencing that American dream up to where they can have access to it. So Dr. King, tell us more about your understanding and your belief about the people who are not experiencing uh, the American dream at this point. But tragically and unfortunately, there is another America. And this other America has a daily ugliness about it that constantly transforms the buoyancy of hope into the fatigue of despair. In this America, millions of work-starved men 
walk the streets daily and search for jobs that do not exist. In this America, millions of people find themselves living in rat-infested, vermin-filled slums. In this America, people are poor by the millions, and they find themselves perishing on a lonely island of poverty. As I listen to this presentation of Dr. King, I wonder if he would see the world any different with so many millions of people trapped in poverty in those inner cities, in those ghetto areas, um, families without a father, families without any guidance, families without any income, uh, relying mostly on government funding in so many uh, ways and so many areas that businesses are not developing. There's no entrepreneurship. There's no national businesses, no grocery stores, the, the, there's no good lighting in the areas that is, makes it conducive to crime at night, all the gangs that still exist. I just wonder if Martin Luther King would have changed the trajectory of our country for the better for the black community. But let's go on and listen to the next part of his presentation. It talks about the people he is most concerned about. Remember now that he has four children, and so he's looking to the future, he's looking to the impact of what's going on in this country and what's going on in the black community and the poverty that exists and the impact on the children. In a sense, the greatest tragedy of this other America is what it does to little children. Little children in this other America are forced to grow up with clouds of inferiority forming every day in their little mental skies. And as we look at this other America, we see it as an arena of blasted hopes and shattered dreams. So here Dr. King first talks about the impact on children. But then I take his comments about shattered hopes and shattered dreams, not just of children, but of the adults that actually find themselves impoverished in such a way as to think it's so difficult to get out and the American dream of getting ahead and advancing so that your children can have a better life, that those hopes and dreams are not reality for most of these folks. Now, let's go on to the next part of his presentation and understand that he is not just talking about the black community. Again, he is of a love of all mankind. And so you'll hear him talk about the poverty of this country that needs to be resolved, but not just for the black community, but for all communities. Many people of various backgrounds live in this other America, uh, America. Some are Mexican Americans, some are Puerto Ricans, some are Indians, uh, some uh, happen to be from other groups. Millions of them are Appalachian whites. Probably the largest group in this other America in proportion to its size in the population is the American Negro. The American Negro finds himself living in a triple ghetto, a ghetto of race, a ghetto of poverty, a ghetto of... So having described the level of poverty, the impact on all races, not just on the black community, but on all races, Dr. King, let's hear what your thoughts are on how we solve this, or what is your vision for moving forward with this issue of poverty that you're trying to describe and address in this presentation? Is to deal with this problem, to deal with this problem of the two Americas. We are seeking to make America one nation, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. So audience, I want you to listen carefully. He's quoting articles of the Constitution, 
articles of our Bill of Rights, articles out of our, um, our Pledge of Allegiance, our national motto of from, from many one. So he's trying to bring us together. He's not trying to pit one group against the other one as we see so many black leaders do today. So let's also hear now how he wants to move forward and recognize um, that other America and how we can actually be one people and what he's trying to really get at with the unification message. Now let me say that the struggle for civil rights and the struggle to make these two Americas one America is much more difficult today than it was five or ten years ago. Let, let me interrupt Dr. King's presentation here because this is an important point he's just made and I want to get into more detail of it in the next segment. He's saying that in 1967, it was easier 10 years ago to deal with discrimination and racism than it is at the end of 1960s. And I want to delve into that a little bit more because I think it has much to do with what is still undone in this country today. So the things that he accomplished, he said the next phase is much more difficult. And now we're 55 years later, and I want to see if we can create a parallel between what he said needs to get done and what actually got done and what is still applicable today. So let's take a commercial break, and we'll be right back with Dr. King. Welcome back to America's Web Radio. We're going to continue to look at this presentation of Dr. Martin Luther King on what he called the other America, because I think it highlights in a different way than even his um, well-known I have a dream speech. It outlines the issues and problems and solutions that he suggests are needed to overcome racism, discrimination, segregation in the United States. And we finished up the last uh, segment of this program uh, by him saying that it actually was easier in the last 10 to 12 years, the speech being given in 1967. So from, you know, maybe 1955 to 1967 time period, that that was solving, in his opinion, some of the easier problems that existed. And he wants to look forward to the next phase, which he sees as a much more difficult solution to create this One America. And we all know, listen to this program, we've not created the One America. So clearly, he knows that it's going to be a very difficult struggle. And 55 years later, we have not resolved uh, some of the issues that he's raised. So let me go back to the speech where he outlines what he did, because many of us maybe forget or not particularly empathetic or sympathetic to what was actually happening before many of us here were born in this audience, that what was happening in the late 1950s and into the 1960s, the problems and issues that Martin Luther King was the leader in addressing the racism that existed, the segregation that existed. So, uh, Dr. King, tell us about the successes that you had up to this point of the speech that you're giving today. We struggled all across the South in glorious struggles to get rid of legal, overt segregation and all of the humiliation that surrounded that system of segregation. In a sense, this was a struggle for decency. We could not go to a lunch counter in so many instances and get a hamburger or a cup of coffee. We could not make use of public accommodations. Public transportation was segregated, and often we had to sit in the back and within transportation, uh, transportation within cities, we often had to stand over empty seats because sections were reserved for whites only. We did not have the right to vote in so many areas of the South. And the struggle was to deal with these problems. So the next segment of his speech tells about how he dealt with those 
historical problems that he's addressed by 1967 to the best effect that he could, but how he also engaged and enrolled people into his cause uh, to help deal with the segregation that was most prevalent in the South, but was around the rest of the country as well. But if you deal with it in the most extreme areas of the South, the rest of the country would come along pretty rapidly for the most part. So, Dr. King, tell us how you dealt with the problems as you saw them. Uh, certainly, they were difficult problems. They were humiliating conditions. By the thousands, we protested these conditions. We made it clear that it was ultimately more honorable to accept jail cell experiences than to accept segregation and humiliation. By the thousand students and adults decided to sit in at segregated lunch counters to protest conditions there. Now, I want our audience to listen carefully to this next segment because he draws on the American dream as being what's behind his peaceful, uh, nonviolent approach to changing the laws and regulations of the country to try to eliminate racism and segregation and biases and hatred of one race for the other. He uses the our own founding fathers and our own founding documents to emphasize that that's what he's trying to do, to get the dream of our founding fathers a reality for the entire country. So, Dr. King, tell us more about how you relate the issues that you're dealing with to our own founding fathers and the American dream. When they were sitting at those lunch counters, they were in reality standing up for the best in the American dream and seeking to take the whole nation back to those great wells of democracy which were dug deep by the founding fathers in the formulation of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. So, Dr. King, tell us about the successes of this approach that you had, showing that nonviolent approach, uh, love for mankind, focusing on our founding father's dream, the American dream, uh, equality for all, how doing that in a peaceful revolution, if you will, a message of love and unity, uh, not tearing down one side of our country or one people in order to advantage another people, but tell us the successes that you had uh, during this period of time for those people who didn't live in that period of time. What happened in the 1950s and 1960s based upon your efforts? Many things were gained as a result of these years of struggle. In 1964, the Civil Rights Bill came into being after the Birmingham Movement, which did a great deal to subpoena the conscience of a large segment of the nation to appear before the judgment seat of morality on the whole question of civil rights. After the Selma Movement in 1965, we were able to get a voting rights bill. Now, all of these things represented strides. I don't know about our audience, but I personally, in putting this uh, presentation together, almost feel like uh, Martin Luther King is speaking to us from his heavenly seat of giving us some information about the, what the country is today and how he would view the country's problems and issues. He talks about how he would approach the changes and how he did approach the changes. And we heard about his personal story of, of his family being endangered, but he stuck by his principles of nonviolence and love for mankind and trying to create a unified country based upon the founding documents and the dreams of our founding fathers. So he's almost speaking to us from heaven in this presentation. And now I want to turn back to the comment he made at the end of the last session and said that the easy part was over. We've heard so much of what was done it was almost miraculous to get the kind of changes 
in this country around reversing and moving away from racism in so many areas and ways, but there's so much more yet to be done. So, um, Dr. King, uh, tell us about the difficulties now uh, moving ahead, that the easy part, in your opinion, is over, and now we've got some very difficult times ahead for the next level of change. But we must see that the struggle today is much more difficult. It's more difficult today because we are struggling now for genuine equality. And it's much easier to integrate a lunch counter than it is to guarantee a livable income and a good, solid job. It's much easier to guarantee the right to vote than it is to guarantee the right to live in sanitary, decent housing conditions. It is much easier to integrate a public park than it is to make genuine, quality, integrated education a reality. And so today, we are struggling for something which says we demand genuine equality. So, Dr. King, as you move into this next phase, and we're talking here now a presentation that you made in 1967, but I think there's a lot of truth to it in 2022, 55 years later. What is the biggest hurdle that you see in moving to this next stage since you had so much success in the 1950s and 60s? What is the issue that you see uh, needs to be addressed next? And what is the social compact that you had, the unification against much of what you saw in the South? Where is that social contract as we move forward to change and create true equality? And I came to see that so many people who supported morally and even financially what we were doing in Birmingham and Selma were really outraged against the extremist behavior of Bull Connor and Jim Clark toward Negroes rather than believing in genuine equality for Negroes. And I think this is what we've got to see now, and this is what makes the struggle much more difficult. So what I hear you say, Dr. King, is that people were actually more outraged by the extremism towards blacks in the South than they were about really supporting true equality. So give us some examples of where you want to move next, where the equality needs to come from. What are the issues that need to be addressed if people really wanted true equality? And so as a result of all of this, we see many problems existing today that are growing more difficult. It's something that is often overlooked, but Negroes generally live in worse slums today than 20 or 25 years ago. In the North, schools are more segregated today than they were in 1954 when the Supreme Court's decision on desegregation was rendered. Economically, the Negro is worth, worse off today than he was 15 and 20 years ago. And so the unemployment rate among whites at one time was about the same as the unemployment rate among Negroes. But today the unemployment rate among Negroes is twice that of whites. And the average income of the Negro is today 50% less than whites. And as we look at these problems, we see them growing and developing every day. And we see the fact that the Negro economically is facing a depression in his everyday life that is more staggering than the depression of the 30s. Amen and amen. We are saying the exact same things 55 years later of what you spoke about in 1967. It's almost though you're speaking to us from that heavenly seat 
and describing exactly where we are today. Well, let's take a break. I want to come back and talk more with Dr. King from his position in 1967, but sending words to us in today's world about how we should solve some of the problems that are facing us when we try to deal with racism and segregation and the differences of not being a unified country. Be right back after this commercial. Welcome back to the final segment of Healthcare Insight on America's Web Radio. And I want to spend as much time possible, so I'll cut this um, introduction to the segment short. But we are interviewing basically Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., honoring him on this week of his birth by hearing his words, almost as if we're hearing them from his heavenly seat, telling us about today's world as he's describing what he saw and what he feels from 1967. One of the greatest issues that need to be addressed today is black unemployment. Let's hear from Dr. Martin Luther King using numbers and statistics that would apply equally today as they did in 1967 on the problem of black unemployment and the way it creates basically a depression within that community, even if the rest of the country and the rest of the world is thriving. The unemployment rate of the nation as a whole is about 4%. Statistics would say from the Labor Department that among Negroes it's about 8.4 percent. But these are the persons who are in the labor market, who still go to employment agencies to seek jobs, and so they can be calculated. The statistics can be gotten because they are still somehow in the labor market. But there are hundreds of thousands of Negroes who have given up. They've lost hope. They come to feel that life is a long and desolate corridor for them with no exit sign. And so they no longer go to look for a job. There are those who would estimate that these persons who are called the discouraged persons would be six or seven percent in the Negro community. And that means that unemployment among Negroes may well be 16 percent. Among Negro youth in some of our large uh, urban areas, it goes to 30 and 40 percent. And so you can see what I mean when I say that in the Negro community, that is a major, tragic, and staggering depression that we face in our everyday lives. The other great issue that Dr. King talks about that is still with us today is the idea of racism. Now, the Democratic Party in today's world throws around that term very loosely and doesn't really define it as it is um, really to be defined. That is that one race feels superior to the other. That was the issue to a large extent in the 1960s, that there was a feeling of white superiority over the black race. And that may still be with us at a subconscious level and conscious for many people, but it is not the way you throw around the term racism on every issue that if you're in opposition to a, a political thought that you're now a racist. So let's hear what Dr. King's definition is of racism so that we can all uh, understand what true racism is so that we can better address it should we come across it in our own lives or lives of people around us. And we must see racism for what it is. It is a myth of the superior and the inferior race. It is the false and tragic notion that one particular group, one particular race is responsible for all of the progress, all of the insights, and the total flow of history. And the theory that another group or another race is totally depraved, innately impure, and innately inferior. Notice that Dr. King understands the real term and the meaning of racism, that one race feels it is superior over another race. I don't think that image or that thought is so pervasive in the United States today, so I think we have addressed that. Yes, there are going to be pockets of 
people who think they're inferior, whether it's whites thinking they're inferior over another nationality, whether it's uh, Polish or whether it's Irish, uh, whether it's uh, Germans feeling they're superior over anybody else or uh, English feeling they're superior. So that kind of superiority exists in many areas. But the ultimate, the ultimate danger of true racism, as Dr. King has talked about, is wiping out the inferior race because they are inherently evil in some ways or other. So let's hear him talk directly about the true evils of having the real true racist ideas in mind of being superior over another race or another people. In the final analysis, racism is evil because this, its ultimate logic is genocide. Hitler was a sick and tragic man who carried racism to its logical conclusion. And he ended up leading a nation to the point of killing about six million Jews. And this is a tragedy of racism because its ultimate logic is genocide. If one says that I am not good enough to live next door to him, if one says that I am not good enough to eat at a lunch counter, or to have a good, decent job, or to go to school with him, merely because of my race, he is saying consciously or unconsciously that I do not deserve to exist. In these words from over 55 years ago, Dr. King even talks about uh, today's concept of white supremacy. Back then he called it white backlash. So let me hear from Dr. King. Let us all hear. Let us listen to the words of Dr. King around this idea of white supremacy that he refers to as white backlash. The white backlash is merely a new name for an old phenomenon. It's not something that just came into being because shouts of shouts of black power or because Negroes engaged in riots. It may well be that shouts of black power and riots in Watts and the Hollands and the other areas are the consequences of the white backlash rather than the cause of them. I think here Dr. King is emphasizing the fact that people have been kept down for so long that they are reacting and responding in not ways that he would promote and accept because he does not accept the violence, but he is identifying that as an outcrop of not understanding the nonviolent approach to real change. And so if we don't convince people about nonviolence, then we will have these kind of eruptions and certainly they have happened over the 55 years since he gave his speech. So I want to take one more segment here about his discussion that the United States and the people of the country have never really fully embraced the idea of equality for the minority community. So, uh, Dr. King, give us that perspective one more time. What it is necessary to see is that there has never been a single solid monistic determined commitment on the part of the vast majority of white Americans on the whole question of civil rights and on the whole question of racial equality. This is something that truth impels all men of goodwill to admit. All of these things have brought about a great deal of despair and a great deal of desperation, a great deal of disappointment and even bitterness in the Negro communities. And today all of our cities confront huge problems. All of our cities are potentially powder kegs as a result of the continued existence of these conditions, many in moments of anger, many in moments of deep bitterness, engage in riots. And let me say, as I've always said, and I will always continue to say, 
that riots are socially destructive and self-defeating. I'm still convinced that non-violence is the most potent weapon available to oppress people in their struggle for freedom and justice. So in these last few minutes, I'd like to hear Dr. King's words from his heavenly seat, uh, the prophetic words about r racial unrest, riots in our cities, and how he looks at what happened in the 1960s, and his words are so appropriate for today's world. I want our audience to listen carefully to the problems and issues and his approach to nonviolence that he preaches in the midst of all the rioting that was happening in 1960s and the riots today. Listen to his words as if he was talking to the public today in 2022. I feel that violence will only create more social problems than they will solve. So I will continue to condemn riots and continue to say to my brothers and sisters that this is not the way. I continue to affirm that there is another way. But at the same time, it is as necessary for me to be as vigorous in condemning the conditions which cause persons to feel that they must ga engage in riotous activities as it is for me to condemn riots. I think America must see that riots do not develop out of thin air. Certain conditions continue to exist in our society which must be condemned as vigorously as we condemn riots. In the final analysis, a riot is the language of the unheard. What is it that America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last few years. It has failed to hear that the promises of freedom and justice have not been met. And so, in a real sense, our nation's summers of riots are caused by our nation's winters of delay. And as long as America postpones justice, we stand in the position of having these recurrences of violence and riots over and over again. Social justice and progress are the absolute guarantors of riot prevention. Thank you, audience, for listening to this maybe unique tribute to Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., one of the great heroes of the United States, who we wish somebody like him still existed in this country today. Words from on high, words from the past that are just as applicable today, and I suspect Dr. Martin Luther King would be appalled at the current situation of the minority community. And he might even recognize that it is big government. It's the big programs and the giveaways as opposed to calling on the ideals and lifting up people with education, with family support, with community support, but not replacing husbands with a paycheck, not destroying the black family, not destroying the educational system so that they can't find the jobs that they need. I think you would find a difference in the political parties on how they truly want to help, not just help people by giving them a fish, but by teaching them how to fish. I think his biblical and faith-based approach would be nice to see in some of today's modern-day uh, minority leaders. So join us again next week, and we will take on a new topic of importance in this country, looking at the health care of the United States of America.